I'm going to go ahead and pray us into this moment. And I do want to get serious with you. And I do want to say thank you for coming. Thank you for taking a risk on what this is. Thank you for maybe not knowing exactly what this is or why you're even here, <laughs> especially after those two stories. <laughs> but thank you for being here. Thank you for really being here to see more of Jesus because that's why we're all here. So let's just go to the throne room tonight. Jesus, I love you so much. Your spirit has to fall fresh or these are just a bunch of scribbles on white pieces of paper. Just a broken woman that's just speaking a word. It has to be your spirit, God. You work in everyday miracles in our lives and I want us to become more aware of your presence. May your spirit fall fresh on this place. May whatever is holding us back from being a yes to you, God, remove it immediately, right now. Take it out, strip it out. Lord, it is my joy to serve you tonight. It is my joy to be laid bare and open before these women and that we can truly find more belief, God. We want to find a revelation of more of you. May we not be discouraged in this room tonight. May we be lifted high, lifted high. God, may our minds be unlocked and may our spirits be refreshed when we come out of this place in Jesus' name. I thank you so much for your word and your way. It's in your name we pray, amen. I am so glad. To get started on this text tonight, we are going to be in Luke 1. That is where we're going. I would love for you to get your word out, and I would love for us to go there. It is Christmas time, and this is certainly a Christmas word, but it is not just a Christmas word. This is also a life word, and this has become something that I am walking through personally, and... It has been something that has been very personal for me because this is about creation. This is about quiet whispers of the heart begging for God's breath on something new, something fresh, something almost realer than we know, than we can see, than we can touch and feel, something that's intangible but so real to my soul I want so badly to believe. This isn't about apologetics. This is not an apologetics class. This is not where we're going to know how to defend our faith. This is where we come to the place where we have tasted and I have seen and I know God dwells in the miraculous. That's what this is. That's it. This is us leaving and saying, I have, there is nothing that can shake that from my being because I know it's true. I know that God's real. I know that he works. And we're going to look at a couple of different stories. And really, I just love telling stories. That's really what my heart is. I love gathering together and I love unlocking scripture. And so tonight, I hope these characters come alive for you. And we're going to start in Luke 1, 5. And we're going to talk first about Zacharias and Elizabeth. It says in Luke 1, 5, it says, In the days of Herod, king of Judah, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron. And her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. Now, while he was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. So basically, this is just a quick history to who they are. Zechariah is a priest in the priesthood. He's like the upper echelon. He's like the go-to dude. He's the one that's offering for everybody else, all the whole, uh, to all the children of Israel. This is their priesthood, and they offer, and they are begging for God. They're begging for God. Now, let me just set this up, because the thing about it is, is that they hadn't heard from God in 400 years. You know, we, we kind of sometimes tempt ourselves to think, well, there's always God. Well, there's always God. Well, God's always an option. Well, I can always lean in on God. But what if it had been 400 years 
And they're just doing this thing. And all the children of Israel just kind of, kind of visualize it for me that it would be like your pastors, all of your pastors, and maybe even the deacon body were gathered together inside the church house, and you were not allowed to be in there, so you had to be on the outside, and you just had to beg for God's presence on their behalf. They had to intercede for you. And that's what Zechariah was doing. He was there. It is, there was no breath of God, no zeal, no new, just normalcy for 400 years. 400 years. Nothing. 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 I think so often we take so for granted that we can just come into the presence of the Lord anytime and I can just put my request before him. And I can say, it's this, and it's this, and it's this. But what if it was 400 years? Y'all, last I checked, none of us are living for 400 years. So we're talking generations of individuals with no inspiration. We go where there's inspiration. We may not even agree with who's, being in, who's inspiring the group, but I want to be inspired. I want to be, I want to feel like I've got a vision in front of me. I want to feel like I've got something to live for. I want someone to tell me I've got something to live for. And imagine 400 years of just do the deal, okay? Just do the deal. There's nothing. There's not going to be anything. We don't know how long this is going to last. It says that it was called, it was referred to as the 400 years of silence. During those 400 years, we have no record of any prophet or any inspired writers in Israel. If you shoot over just real quick to Psalm 30, or 74, 9, excuse me. Psalm 74, 9. We do not see our signs. There is no longer any prophet, and there is none, none among us who knows how long. Do you feel that way sometimes? Where you're like, I don't see anything new. There's nothing. And on top of this, Zachariah and Elizabeth were coming to a place where they had begged God for a child, and it was not a, it was not happening. I mean, these are old people, They're not having babies. Eggs are dying. It's not going to happen. And he's going, and he's offering for the group. All the children of Israel, it says, are on the outside of the gates, and they're they're pleading. They're pleading, but then he's got this ache inside himself personally, because see, it's not always corporate. It's always personal first. It has to be. Then it's corporate. So he's in there and he's offering for the group, but there's this personal ache because they cannot have a child. So he's offering for the group, but there's always a personal ache. And he's got this personal ache and he wants so badly. They want so badly to have a child, but there's nothing. But there's nothing. There's no new revelation. There's no new inspiration. There's no new vision. And on top of that, God's not even answering my own prayers. I mean, that could just make you want to give up. I don't know about y'all. But if I'm going to the church house and I'm teaching Sunday school week in and week out, and I'm like, let me tell y'all, this is how it's going to go. This is what you need to do. But in my own personal life, I'm not seeing any answer to my pleas. It can get a little dry. You can start to think, you know what? This is for the birds. I don't even know why I'm doing this. Yeah, yeah, la, 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 everybody do it right. Yay, God, please don't strike me dead. I mean, we could just get real rote because we think it's not even personal. You're not even answering my prayers. And I know that that's exactly where Zechariah was. And it says, And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside the hour of incense. No new inspiration, no new revelation, no new vision, and yet they prayed, and yet they positioned themselves to need God. Let's move on to verse 11. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer, that's going to be important, this right here, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And there 
and, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before them in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn their hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just and to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. There are a couple things here, and I know that was a lot of text, but there's a couple things here that are interesting. Zechariah com Zachariah comes to Gabriel and says, how can this be? He says, how can this be? Right there. He's gone in, he's asking, he's pleading. God's presence come, 400 years, nothing, nothing, nothing. 400 years, nothing, nothing, nothing. I'm asking for God's presence to come. Boom, God's presence comes. And what does he do? He goes, whoa, wait a minute. I don't know, I wasn't ready for this. And it's like, but this is your job. This is what you're supposed to do. You were supposed to call the presence of God here. And he's like, but I'm not ready for this. I wasn't ready for this. And Gabriel says, but it doesn't matter. I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. I'm here to tell you what God has said. And he has heard your prayer. He's heard your prayer. Your prayers stand heard. Your prayers stand heard. But Zechariah, to his total defense, to his total and complete defense, all he's seen is unanswered prayers. All he's seen is things just not open up. This doesn't work out for me, God. You're not talking to the group. You're not talking to me. All he's seen is unanswered prayers. Have you ever, have you ever felt that? Have you ever just seen something on the outside in, almost like a Gabriel for someone else? And you're like, but there's miracles happening. But they can't see it because all they've seen is the reality of unanswered prayers. And all they say is, I'm not ready. I'm a, I'm a little afraid. And Gabriel says to him, don't be afraid. But Zechariah comes to him and says, how can this be? How can this be? And then he rattled off a million reasons why it was not possible. The realness of what wasn't happening was more touchable than the untouchable idea of God really moving. Me plus me will always equal me. And that's the equation he was using. But Gabriel, you don't understand. It's me plus me, and it always equals me. There's no, no enlightenment. There's no nothing. There's no refreshing. There's no nothing. And he was like, me plus me equals me. And Gabriel just stood there, and he listened. And he listened, and Oswald Chambers says it like this. It says, he says, Zachariah indulged in the luxury of self-misery. It's almost like sometimes our unanswered prayers become our little pet that we just want to love and we just want to squeeze. And when God gives us a, a window and says, but I'm going to open this door, sometimes we kind of feel like, oh, but no, but what am I supposed to do? I just have to like to believe you that you really are going to work like I've asked you to work? Like you really are who you say you are? And God says, yeah, you just got to let it go. But sometimes we come to this place where we have, you know, we've just kind of wrung our little hands just all around this little thing that we just want so desperate. And we're, it's a dream. It's an unfulfilled, you know, blessing in our marriage. It's a baby. It's, it's a job. It's, a, it's something. It's a boyfriend. It's a, it's a change. It's a home. It's a It's freedom. It's just something, and we just hold on to it, and we love to retell it, and we love to tell other people about it, and we love to tell how it's not getting answered, and we love to say how sad we are because it's not getting answered. And all the while, Gabriel is standing before us, and he is saying, the door of heaven is opening, and I'm telling you, there's a plan. To everything that doesn't seem like it's being answered, to everything that doesn't seem like it's being heard, I'm telling you now, as I stand before you, it's been heard. We just have to accept it. But sometimes we don't want to. We don't want to, and I'll tell you why. Because we become untethered. Has anybody seen the movie Gravity yet? Yeah. Okay, I have not seen it yet because I'm terrified of the commercials for it. And I will say that it makes me very unnerved when Sandra Bullock is like, I'm untethered! I'm untethered! Because I think that's kind of like a personal thing. Like I feel like that's how I feel in life. Like, I'm untethered! I'm untethered! You know, it just seems like that's what it would be like. It, so, God, you're saying that, like, you really are going to work, but you're just giving me this little plan as to how you've, you're going to answer those unanswered prayers for years, and there's been no voice of you, and I don't even know, are you judging me? Are you condemning me? Is that why you're here? Because sometimes we can think that, and, and really, in Old Testament context, that's probably what he thought. God was there to judge him, to condemn him. 
Because that's kind of maybe what, all, all the only thing that was happening. But that's when God says, no, I'm here to love you. But you have to let go. You have to be okay being untethered. You have to be okay being untethered to the unanswered prayer and now tether yourself to an answered prayer. And it may or may not unfold like you want it, but I'm telling you, it's going to be what you want. But sometimes we're not willing to risk. It's too afraid. I'm too afraid. Because generational iniquity says, this is always how it's been. Generational iniquity says, I can't ever unplug from that. And, and I've been sad because that's just my story. But I'm kind of not sad because I know that story. And this is unscripted, and this isn't in the books. If the only books he's reading is 400 years worth of no inspired word, no prophecy, no nothing new, how many times do we download a book in a day, y'all? In a day. Our candles are on fire with how many books? It's like, oh, $4.99, oh, $4.99, oh, $3.99. It's like, download, 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 inspire me, inspire me, inspire me, inspire me, inspire me. We're nearly inspired and we're numb. We're so inspired, we're numb. Do you know? We're so inspired, it's like, oh, well, that's not really any good. And it could be the deepest word that's ever been written, but because it wasn't packaged right, we're like, nah. Think of 400 years of nothing. And then God says, I'm going to open it up. And it's I don't know if I want to buy that book. I'm not really sure. I haven't heard a commentary on that yet. I, no, it's not been on The View, so I'm not really sure yet. Um, I, I, I don't know. Let me just think about that. And when I was talking to Toby about this text, we were saying, right there, Gabriel almost says, it's all or nothing, baby. It's all or nothing right here. I'm sorry. You don't really have an option. It's all or nothing. I heard your prayers. I know what you want. I'm telling you. I'm taking you there right now. It's all or nothing. It's all or nothing. And God was merciful. He didn't condemn him. He didn't. I think so many times without me even knowing it, I think if I question God or I come to him with a little bit of reservation, he's just going to smite me. Like you're out of the plan, you know. I don't know why I think that's just like a weird combo. It's kind of like my kids panic. They think I'm going to leave them all the time. I'm like, when have I ever left you? And yet they feel terrified I'm going to leave them. Go figure. I don't know. It's just in us, I guess. But right here, God was merciful. And he shows us that he's a God that doesn't only hear our prayers. He knows our lives. And he also so merci mercifully and graciously weaves us into his kingdom purposes. He does. He does. He takes everything that's all the garb of everything we've ever been or everything we've ever longed for, everything we really didn't even know we were praying for, he takes it all together and he says, I know what she really wants. Mm -hmm. They want a child, but they also want to be influential. I hear that. I hear them say in their prayers without their voice but with their heart, let us be a part of the kingdom impact. Because there is no way God would have woven them into this story as good as it ends up getting if it wasn't really in them to want to be woven in. Do you see? Because they didn't just get any child. They didn't just get any child. See, this is what we do. And my pastor delivered a message just this week. It was amazing. It was so good to be under the teaching of it because I wanted to stand up and shout, yes! Because God doesn't just give us any answer to our prayers. He doesn't. He doesn't. When God answers, I mean, he's going to answer. It's going to be an answer. And he's going to unfold it. And the thing about it was that was so great is that he didn't just answer just the one prayer they had. Oh, just give us a baby. Isn't that how we do? We kind of see, we come over here and we say, I want a red bite for Christmas. And God's kind of like, okay, you can have a red bite for Christmas, but I have all these other things. We just say, just, if you just open the storehouses, just whatever you got in there, you know, you just go ahead and wrap it all up. <laughs> but God knew their heart. He knew they didn't just want a baby. They wanted that baby. They wanted that life. They wanted that new. Really, if you think about it in context of the scripture, they wanted a voice. They wanted a voice. Birth something, anything. Birth something. Have you ever been there? Where you just toss your hands up to the Lord in your car and you just go, just do something. 
I don't care what you do, just do something, just move in some way. I can't keep going around and around and around and I'm starting to look like a fool because that's what they looked like. Because they'd gotten out around town that they, didn't, they weren't having a child. And now they're up in years and it's like, yeah, they never had a child. I don't know what's wrong with them. Nothing. <laughs> they were a part of God's kingdom plan. And everything had to go just so. Everything. Everything. And in his mercy, God closed his mouth. Gabriel says in the text, go back up, it says, But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, for your prayer has been heard. And your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. So you hear that? It says you will have joy, you will have gladness, many will rejoice. This is a good thing. And skip down, skip down, and Zacharias says to the angel, how shall I know this? Or in other texts it says, how, will, how can this be? For I am an old man, my wife is advanced in years. And the angel answered him, hey, I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you'll be silent and unable to speak till the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. Regardless of how our prayers are offered, perfect, imperfect, angry, a twinge of resentment, burning with hot tears, a hundred questions, in complete humility, full of grace and surrender, it doesn't matter. God hears the prayers of his righteous children, and if given the time to work, he will weld every last one of them into his kingdom purposes. Every last one of them. And then he will stand back and he will say, it will be answered with great joy and exceeding gladness and everyone will rejoice. All the shame that you feel will be removed because everyone will rejoice with you because you will be a part of the kingdom plan. But what does he say? Bless his precious heart. He's like, yeah, I don't think so. Nice try, Gabriel. You're like all angelic and stuff, but that's not going to happen. I know you've got the wings going on and the big cape and stuff, but that's not going to happen. Because again, it's me plus me equals me. But when we take me completely out of it, and that's what Gabriel wanted. Uh, this isn't about you, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm so sorry. This is about what God wants to do through you. If we can ever get that through our skulls. Mamas, it's not about us. It's about what God wants to do through us. It's not about the leg pulling and the dinners burning and the laundries piling. It's not about us. It's about the kingdom. Healing your marriage isn't about you. It's about healing the kingdom. Having a baby, having a dream, having a longing isn't about you. It's about healing the kingdom. And that's what God was saying. He was saying, through Gabriel, look, it's not about you. This is about healing the kingdom. This is about this great rescue plan that's about to take place. This, that's what this is about. So I'm going to shut your mouth by grace, through mercy. I'm just, I'm just going to let you have a second. Have you ever heard your kids come to you and they're just complaining about something and they want something? They're like, we're not going to get such and such. And you're like, well, you don't even know. You don't even know. We're about to just blow your mind. <laughs> We just did that this summer. Matter of fact, we took the kids on a surprise vacation and we totally surprised them at the airport and took them to Disney World. It was the most unreal, amazing vacation ever. It was, I was I'm still pinching myself that we got to go. But it was one of those times where it was like, can we just go swimming? I mean, are we gonna go swimming? And I was like, tomorrow you will be in Disney World. But I couldn't tell them because I was like, they'll freak out, it's too much. They can't contain that blessing. That's what God knows about us. Oh, honey, if you'll just wait just a second, pray one more time. Just pray one more time, but I am coming, and it's Disney World. 
is more than you can understand or fathom. It would stress you out to the max because you'd be worried about things that you don't need to be thinking about. That's not for us right now. What's for us right now is your obedience right now in this second. Tomorrow morning, your bottom is going to be on a plane headed to Orlando, but right now, your feet are right here. It's going to be good if we just let God unfold it. And in his mercy, he closes his mouth. We have to go to Job. We have to go to Job 42. You know, there are several characters in the Bible that God does this with. Moses, Isaiah, Job, some freely. Some they themselves are like, ugh. I just, which is largely me. <laughs> I'm so... So many times I'm like, I don't know, I'm so. Because I don't know. Have you ever had that moment where you just were irrational and you just made a decision? I mean, maybe I'm the only one that does that on the regular. But irrational, prideful decisions. Oh, I'm going to show you. No, I want you to go here with their husbands. <laughs> Mine's in the room. You know, where you're just like, no, uh -uh, you're not, uh, no, don't even try it, don't, don't talk to me about it, no, I'm headlong, I'm going this way, and it's totally out of pride, has nothing to do with that being the better plan, but I'm like, no, we're going, uh, we're going this way. If we can just, sometimes, because we didn't know, because we didn't know. Job 42, it's two, it says, I know that you can do all things. This is after every part of Job's life has been stripped. Sometimes does it feel like that when everything is just stripped? It's almost a glorious moment. When you just come to the end of every question you've ever asked. And Job comes to the Lord and he says this, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I do not understand. Things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear, and I will speak. I will question you, and you will make it known to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ears, but now my eyes have seen you. And that's exactly what God is doing right here. That's right what he's doing for Zechariah and Elizabeth. Prayers offered stand heard in heaven, and they are woven into a beautiful tapestry of kingdom purposes. God doesn't freak out and make irrational decisions like I do. He doesn't hear our prayers and see our angry fists and freak out. He just doesn't. I think he does, but he doesn't. He doesn't operate like I do, where I just get angry, irrational, I just make a decision. I'm just going to go with it. God says, I know where we're going, and I'm not going to derail because I know what has to happen in order for the greater good. I know what has to happen for this big, massive kingdom plan, and that's what these miracles are about. That's what belief is. It's not in breaking down whether God exists or not. It's about belief in the God that exists, period. And it's about our play in that belief. It's about our play in that belief. And it's not about doing more. It's not about doing more, and I feel like we need to hear that, ladies. It's not about doing more or finding more, and it's not a treasure map which can't be uncovered. It's about just letting more awareness of his presence be made known. You know, whenever I was studying this text, it says, on up, a couple, couple verses right up. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. You know, if you think about it, when I read that, I just read it and I just moved on. But then I thought, wait a minute, 400 years of silence. Mm -hmm. Jesus hasn't come. He hasn't lived. There's been no ministry. He hasn't died. He hasn't come from the grave. There's been no help established. Mm -hmm. Why are we talking about the Holy Spirit? I was like, huh, that's interesting. I mean, I know in Old Testament, when Ab Abram and Sarai became Abraham and Sarah is because the breath of God breathed on them. So I know that there's context for the Holy Spirit and more or less the breath of God, the ruha, the breath. 
But it's interesting to me that the Gabriel says to him, the Holy Spirit will be with you and will also be with your child from the womb. And I did a little research, and New Testament in the Greek, this actual breakdown of this wording of the Holy Spirit is pneuma, P-N-E-U-M-A, which is neuter, and therefore the Spirit is correctly referred to as it rather than he. There's still a trinity, and this is kind of jumping around. The trinity exists at this minute, okay? But here's the thing. Jesus hasn't come yet. The helper isn't needed because Jesus isn't left yet, okay? But we still need the breath. And more than that, what's so amazing about this word, pneuma, God's active force. 400 years of silence, remember? Nothing. How long, oh Lord? Nothing. I'm telling you right now, if I'm praying the prayer, nothing, God, it's been nothing. There's nothing. I'm going to tell you what I want. I want a holy force. I don't just want breath. I want like a tidal crashing wave to just splash all over me. I want God's force. I want to change everything. If I've been longing for so long and I've been pleading, not just for an individual thing, but almost for an entire people, for an entire kingdom purpose. I want God's force. It was literally a breathing force from God himself. That's why it's called an it. Because it was. It just was. It just was. When Gabriel expresses that the Holy Spirit is already indwelling in their child and will go out as the spirit of Elijah did. Elijah was the last prophet that anybody knows about. Right there where it's just like the power, that God for zeal. Malachi expressed it, closed it off, said, this is it. This is it. We got to turn. This is it. And there was nothing. And then for them to hear that Elijah, like the famous Elijah, would, his spirit would dwell in their child from birth, it was a word of hope that they could not express. And yet now, in this dispensation of time, they would be found as the parents of the one indwelt with the message of the coming rescue. God wants to indwell in our lives with a force. He doesn't want to just answer your prayers. I'm sorry if that makes you sad. But he doesn't want to just answer our prayers. He wants to come with a force. He doesn't want to just take one side of your prayer or the other side of your prayer. He wants to come over your prayers. He wants to weave your prayers into his prayers for his kingdom. And he wants to do it for a miraculous purpose. Something that saves the whole world. You don't know what prayer you're praying that God's about to unlock, that won't weave into another's life and change the world. We have a lot of different generations represented here tonight, and I love that. I love us all coming together there is not one of us separate from the other, not a one. We all come from different backgrounds, different churches, maybe even different denominations. We all come from different pasts. It doesn't matter. Every prayer you offer the Lord stands heard. And it's not just heard just for you, or just for you, or just for you. It's heard for me. Because somehow what you do affects what I do. And somehow what you do affects what I do. And somehow my prayers offered, my life lived, coincide, coinciding with your life, is for a great kingdom purpose. These characters' story in Luke 1, how we open the text, this is about just a surrender. It's about sometimes it's just like this. And we just say, God, just do it. It's too wonderful for me to understand. Just do it. Whatever it is you're doing, whatever it is about, I got a million and one questions, and I can't do this in myself. 
There's nothing that I can offer for this plan, and that scares the tar out of me. But you have everything. So if you see in me something, then just do it. Father God, may you just do what you want to do. It's not up to us, Jesus. We offer our hearts. There's pleading in this room. There are people that are suffering from things I couldn't possibly know. But you know. You know what each unanswered prayer means. You know what it means when then when you come and you expose. You know what you're doing, God. You know what you're unfolding. We do trust your hand. We do, God. We ask that you would continue to speak to our hearts. Reveal to us your word and your way. It's in Jesus' name.